Flying Tigers began as an innovation to the transportation industry. An all-cargo airline had never existed before. But the idea had probably been incubating during the latter part of World War II in the mind of this man, Robert W. Prescott. Prescott had been part of a spirited bunch of aviators called the American Volunteer Group, or AVG. Under the command of General Claire Chenault, these young daredevils, known as the Flying Tigers, flew their P-40s over Burma and China, protecting the supply lines on the Burma Road from Japanese attack. Prescott also flew military cargo missions over the Himalayas, or the Hump, as it was called, from India to Burma and China. Following the war, the bright but jobless Prescott seized an opportunity to put his flying experience to use. A man by the name of Samuel B. Mosier was looking for a way to move perishable items between Mexico and the U.S. Prescott convinced Mosier that such a job could best be done by airplane. Prescott then proceeded to persuade a handful of his former flying buddies to join him in an exciting new enterprise. With matching funds from Mosier, Prescott and his friends managed to scrounge up enough money to begin the nation's first all-cargo airline. Well, we all had invested our earnings from overseas, and so we were determined that it would succeed. And we worked very, very hard. We did everything that was necessary to keep it going. On June 25, 1945, the National Skyway Freight Corporation, subtitled the Lion of the Flying Tigers was born. With a fleet of former Navy cargo planes called Bud Conestogas, the new organization made its headquarters in a two-car garage at Long Beach Airport in California. Pilots, mechanics, even the gals from the office uh, would help load and take off freight. Well, we washed floors, did janitorial work, washed the airplanes, serviced the airplanes, until we got to the point where we had sufficient uh, uh, personnel to, to do all that. The first shipments were loads of grapes, flowers, and furniture. The airline was in business. Well, we'd stop at every airport, and uh, in the beginning we flew flowers west to east, which was a natural, and some fruit. And then also from the east coast, mainly it was furniture kind of like a moving van, a moving line. But also, when we were empty, and we were empty a great share of the time, we would uh, go around and try to find passengers in the crowded terminals, and then we'd offer them a good deal, much less than the airfare, and we'd uh, usually get a few from a, a, a handful to maybe a dozen or sometimes a, a two dozen people to fly with us. And so that supported us. And, paid for the expenses, the gasoline. The fledgling company struggled for survival during those early days since shipments were scarce and the bills were piled high. There were a few times that Bob Prescott came down and says, hey, we don't have enough money. Here's your check, but don't cash it for about two weeks. And we were so hard up for money in those days. We used to lock the phone at night so they wouldn't be calling all over. <laughs> they, we couldn't afford it them to use the phone. When they had to file a flight plan, they had to go someplace else and file it. <laughs> it was the military that helped bail out the airline when a large group of sailors chartered planes to get home to New York. This was the first in a long succession of chartered passenger flights that kept revenue flowing when freight loads diminished. A year after the airline began, the buds were replaced by a fleet of C-47s. The C-47s were later supplemented with a fleet of C-54s. Most of the planes were provided by the military when in 1946, the Tigers received a contract to supply the U.S. occupational forces in Japan. At about the same time, Prescott moved the headquarters to Lockheed Air Terminal in Burbank, California. The airline's name was officially changed to the Flying Tiger Line. But Tigers spent about as much time in hearing rooms as it did in the air. The company fought long and hard, trying to get certified by the now defunct Civil Aeronautics Board 
to fly cargo on a regularly scheduled basis. In 1949, the airline was awarded full certification serving Route 100 from Los Angeles to Boston with points in between. It was the first transcontinental air freight certificate ever awarded. It was the first major step of being fully recognized as a certificated freight carrier. And as you know, that route number is 100, which uh, we were the first in it and became the world's largest. In an effort to drive the Tigers out of business, the established airlines began their own freight operations. But the majors had not particularly uh, uh, got into the freight business but practically all of them did so after we were starting to become successful. And airlines like American, Pan Am, TW, they were all doing everything in their power to put us out of business. You know, we had a fleet of 16 C-54s and a bunch of 46s, a couple of dozen of those. And Pan Am was trying to ground our C-46s. And we did all kinds of things to keep the CAA, which was then FAA, was FAA now, uh, from grounding the airplanes, and we were successful. We stayed in business. From the beginning, resourcefulness and innovation were the Flying Tigers' code. Back when the Bud's exhaust pipes kept falling off, Tiger mechanics invented and forged a special wrench to solve the problem. Flying Tigers pioneered the shipment of racehorses between tracks, designing and building specially constructed stalls and custom-built ramps. At that time, we didn't have any, any powered rolling systems or manual loading systems in the airplane. They were all just bulk loaded uh, in what we call bulk loading. And uh, we would walk the animals up a ramp into the airplane and, and stall them in, in stalls that we had positioned on the floor previously. Our maintenance wizards developed a movable refrigeration device to pre-chill an airplane for shipment of perishables. They later designed a built-in refrigeration system for the C-47. Another innovation revolutionized the shipment of clothing. Garments were hung on overhead tubing that followed the contours of the plane. The passenger charter business began to boom in the late 40s and early 50s. Tigers introduced the concept of high-density seating, expanding the DC-4's capacity from 40 to over 100 for special flights. In 1950, with a fleet of C-46s, Tigers was the first to offer low-cost transatlantic tourist service. The Immigration Service awarded Flying Tigers a large contract for transporting illegal Mexican farm workers back to Mexico from the U.S. When the Korean conflict broke out, Flying Tigers was the first to place a civilian plane into service. Instrumental in supporting U.S. forces in Korea, Tigers was the largest military freight and passenger contractor in the Pacific. When Tigers flew Korean war orphans to the States, Tiger maintenance again showed their ingenuity when they built special cradles designed to lay across folded aircraft seats. Uh, we had all the babies on board, and they were all infants and no uh, adults. And it was a very, uh, a very busy trip, to say the least. But very rewarding when you got to Seattle and see the parents pick up their children. Tigers also participated in the airlift of 35,000 near-starving Jewish Yemenites from the Arabian Desert to the new state of Israel. In 1955, the CAB renewed Tiger's certificate for Route 100, which allowed the airline to haul mail and Air Express shipments. From 1955 to 1957, Tigers flew construction crews and supplies to the Arctic for the building of the North American Distant Early Warning System, the Dew Line. We were operating C-54s and 46s up there. And although very critical conditions in flying, all they had at the end of, and mind you, these, these little runways were chopped out of the snow or on a frozen lake, and they either had Christmas trees that they had cut and st stacked along the runway, so you could see, or they had red fuel barrels. But they had things called whiteout. And you could fly over and look down and see the runway, but yet when you got down to 500 feet and come into land, you couldn't see the runway. It was very difficult to tell the horizon or the sky from the land because it's all white and so not much of a horizon as such. 
and they were landing on ice fields and very hazardous flying, but the fellows did a marvelous job. Flying Tigers was expanding and setting records, due in large part to the efforts of its people. But it was great days, and I think all of the boys had that spirit. The maintenance people, the accounting people, the, you know, the flight people. I think it's probably best summed up by Bob Prescott. If you can bring it through the gate, we will fly it. We used to sleep right in the, right in the in the hangar, and uh, you know sometimes we'd have so much work to do that we had, we converted a uh, maintenance shop area that we had, and we had all of the bins where they used to store the, the spare parts, and we made those our bunks. And on the on there, we'd have what time that we worked and what time we wanted to be woken for the next flight. We took on projects that maybe many of us didn't have the experiences in the particular line, be it either in sales and maintenance and uh, managing or what have you, or taking on particular projects that uh, other airlines would perhaps consider have a lot of meetings on and then may not uh, elect to go ahead with the plan. If you didn't do it, and I cannot think of any example that we did not it. it reflected on Bob, and you were the last person in the world to want to give Bob Prescott a bad name. If Bob says we can do it, we can do it. Flying Tigers acquired a fleet of 15 super constellations, Connie's, and inaugurated nonstop coast to coast air freight service in a record time of eight hours. Tiger Maintenance redesigned the Connie's into convertibles which gave them the capability of hauling freight or passengers. In the passenger configuration, Tiger set a single trip record across the North Atlantic with 114 passengers. This was later increased with careful engineering. So what I did, I designed, I staggered the triple seats, because if you put them side by side, you ended up with a 13 inch oil and you had to have 14. By staggering them so that the seat was opposite of where you sat in the other side, we were able to get a 14-inch aisle, and we got 10 more seats in the airplane. Transporting 70,000 travelers in 1957, the Connies gave Tiger's group charter business a tremendous boost. The 60s proved to be another decade of record-setting and innovation. In 1961, Tigers took delivery of a fleet of planes specifically designed for hauling freight, the CL-44 Swingtails. These aircraft were faster, more powerful, had a longer range, and carried a third more freight than the Connie's. The tail would swing aside, allowing cargo to be loaded directly into the cabin, eliminating the usual side door jockeying. The deck floor was equipped with rollers, allowing a new concept in loading, palletized cargo for easier handling. Along with the swing tails, Flying Tigers introduced its first automated cargo terminal in Chicago, Illinois. The innovations continued in 1962 when Flying Tigers began the first coordinated combination sea and air transportation service. This service, called Sea Tiger, became a viable and important part of our business. In fact, allows us to take traffic by ocean from Japan to the port of Los Angeles, put it on a truck or an airplane to the gateway city of New York, and transport that to one of Flying Tiger cities uh, in, in Europe or South America, and have it all on one bill of lading, and allow the customer to deal with Flying Tigers at destination or origin and be able to track that shipment all the way through. The 1960s also saw Tigers entering the jet age with the acquisition of Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 aircraft. The jets were placed into service on the Trans-Pacific route, supplying our U.S. military forces in Vietnam. Flying Tigers was really the premier carrier of military passengers uh, uh, during that period of time. Uh, we operated both primarily DC-8 aircraft. Uh, we had approximately 300 and some odd flight attendants uh, flying for Flying Tigers, uh, tremendously dedicated staff of uh, people. Which was um, 
very dangerous at times, I would say. Uh, we've had many flight attendants had to hit the bunkers uh, upon arrival into uh, various places in Da Nang, I mean into Vietnam. Uh, but fortunately, we had no injuries. A less hazardous charter, dubbed the Polecat, was equipped with weather monitoring gear and scientific instrumentation and set eight speed and distance records in an around-the-world pole-to-pole flight. In the second half of the 60s, Flying Tiger's world headquarters was moved from Burbank to Los Angeles International Airport. The decade ended with Flying Tigers winning the certificate for Route 163, the first trans-Pacific all-cargo route serving the heart of Asia. With 38 flights each week, Flying Tigers soon operated the largest all-cargo schedule between the U.S. and Asia. Because of Flying Tiger's strong financial position, it was able to weather the 1973-74 fuel crisis. The airline was even able to add a new $7 million terminal at JFK International Airport, open the new 10-story High Tiger headquarters building in Los Angeles, and acquire its first two B747-100 series aircraft. Also during that time, Flying Tiger Line Corporation changed its name to Tiger International, with Flying Tiger Line as a subsidiary. Even though Flying Tigers continued to grow, it still took time to show caring and compassion for the world's less fortunate. The company has for years been ready to pick up and go, whether it be a hurricane, uh, a tornado, uh, the Mexico City uh, earthquake, as I recall, we were you know, ready at the wait with uh, services, whether it be an airplane or contributions or getting things from A to B. Uh, this company has a strong, I think, and a, a marvelous reputation for being there when you're needed. In 1975, Flying Tigers flew 176 Mercy missions to the besieged Cambodian city of Phnom Penh. Flying Tiger employees organized two missions to the drought and famine-stricken nation of Ethiopia. A group of employees contacted the uh, top management of Flying Tigers and asked whether or not the company would participate in allowing the employees of Flying Tigers to do something about this on their own and to the extent possible at their own expense. We had put together what we called Life Lift, which was an operation to take one of our 747 aircraft that the company had been good enough to remove from scheduled service. We had uh, just about up to the last pound grossed out the airplane with medical supplies, foods, blankets, baby scales, um, things that were helpful and needed at that time by those people. Um, the cockpit crew was, uh, had volunteered their services. We had two flight attendants who had volunteered their services. Other recent Mercy missions conducted by Flying Tigers included the earthquake relief projects in Mexico City and Soviet Armenia. Flying Tigers is also renowned for its special care and handling in the shipment of animals. From baby chicks and monkeys to killer whales and racehorses, Flying Tigers has done it all. As the 70s continued, a dramatic change occurred not only to Flying Tigers, but to the entire air transportation industry. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter signed legislation that deregulated domestic air freight. What deregulation meant to us at that time was an opportunity to expand into any marketplace that we wanted to go into domestically. Our immediate uh, reaction was not to expand in the U.S. Uh, we did so in the airport-to-airport -airport market, but not in the door-to-door -door market. That's, that is from shipper to consignee. We reacted more by expanding our routes rather than product offerings. Although feeling the effects of deregulation, Tigers continued to expand. Plans were made for a new training center at headquarters, new cargo terminals, new services, and new equipment. But in early 1979, another fuel crisis hit the world. Supply was short, and prices had skyrocketed. 
and the same flexibility that deregulation afforded flying tigers was also given to the growing competition in the air freight business. Well, we saw more and more of the um, airport to airport shippers acquiring their own aircraft. Uh, UPS, for instance, which we had a major contract with, started to fly their own routes. Now, more and more the freight was being channeled through companies that flew their own aircraft. Therefore, our basic customers, those who did not fly their own aircraft, were shrinking. Despite concerns about rising fuel prices and inflation, Flying Tigers pressed on and merged with another experienced veteran of air freight, Seaboard World Airlines. Official as of October 1, 1980, the merger marked a new era in the air freight industry. Seaboard's European and Middle Eastern routes, coupled with Tiger's domestic and Pacific routing, gave the industry something it never had before. Scheduled all cargo single carrier service around the world. Internationally, we expanded, as I said, by buying Seaboard and getting to Europe. And that reaction was created us acquiring a great deal of debt in connection with the Seaboard purchase. Now, initially, that was an adverse reaction. But it did provide us the capacity, eventually, and a few years thereafter, to give us the capacity to expand into the Asian marketplace by offering more frequencies and eventually leading to the revenue base sufficient to make money. Time. Contending with deregulation and stiff competition domestically, Tigers threw itself into the domestic pickup and delivery business. Flying Tigers began a door-to-door -door service promoted with an extensive advertising campaign. On time, or you don't pay. Small, medium, or large. Call Flying Tigers. It's on time, or it's on us. Flying Tigers. While competition continued in the domestic market, it was also beginning to take its toll in our normally strong trans-Pacific market. When we started in the Pacific, we were really the, the all-cargo carrier. We had the, the lion's share of, <clears throat> you know, of the... Um, all the markets to ourselves. I mean, I can remember Taiwan, we used to be 70 percent, and Japan, we used to be 40 percent better, you know, those kinds of things. And that's gradually uh, decreased simply because of the additional capacity that has been introduced into all the, all the markets. American and foreign carriers continued to divert some of our traffic and our revenue. Flying Tigers found itself again struggling for survival. Uh, I don't think the employees realized how bad off we really were. Uh, financially, we were a bankrupt company, although not officially. Um, when, you, when you don't pay your lenders, there's a signal there. You've run out of cash, and we had run out of cash. Airplanes and other assets had to be sold. Uncertainty gripped the airline with fears of corporate takeovers. That was probably the real low point financially for the, for the company. Uh, we had been deteriorating during the early 80s, and interesting enough, some of those decisions, which had a real adverse impact on us and almost led us to bankruptcy, um, were very beneficial in the longer run. The purchase of Seaboard, as I mentioned, uh, uh, gave us the additional 747 aircraft, the purchase of the three Singapore aircraft, passenger aircraft, we eventually swapped with Pan Am for four cargo aircraft. Even though competition continued to take its toll, Flying Tigers implemented plans for a new hub at Rickenbacker Air National Guard Base near Columbus, Ohio. The hub opened in early 1986. I will probably never again experience such a wide range of emotions in my life. It was chaotic. It was hectic. There was all kinds of fears. There was heavy concerns. Uh, a lot of people running around, a lot of last minute items to be taken care of. The first couple of months were absolutely brutal. Long days, a lot of work, a lot of dedicated people. Um, tremendous amounts to attempt to accomplish. A lot of revisions to operating procedures. Uh, a lot of trial and error. A lot of uh, just trying different things. Uh, a lot of innovation, um, 
anything we could do to refine the system, make it work a little better, uh, save a few minutes here, a few seconds there, a little bit of labor somewhere else. All in all, the entire project for startup uh, is really uh, one phenomenal cooperative venture on behalf of Flying Tiger people everywhere. Nearly 500 people assembled at this 196,000 square foot state-of-the-art cargo facility every night to sort the world's air freight. By its second anniversary, the hub had serviced approximately 10,000 flight operations and 300 million pounds of domestic and international air freight. Although the hub proved to be successful, Flying Tiger still was not making the profits needed to survive. So it was necessary to do something about our basic cost structure. Over the years, we had done most everything we could uh, to reduce our costs in terms of uh, furloughs, um, elimination of certain job positions, um, cost containment in every aspect of the company. But we need to do attack the real uh, guts of it. In the fall of 1986, the company implemented a bold three-point plan that resulted in an incredible turnaround for Flying Tigers. If you recall last fall, in a large sense, in a macro sense, we said there were three objectives that we wanted to accomplish and that they needed to fall sequentially. And they were, we needed to reduce our operating expenses to reasonably competitive levels. And two, and following the former, we needed to get the debt of Flying Tigers restructured. And three, and of a longer term nature, we needed to implement a strategic plan that would enable us to carve out a worldwide market niche that we can defend. Plans were implemented to increase lift capacity and to upgrade facilities and equipment. The company also initiated an incentive program called the Partnership Plan, which would allow employees to reap the benefits of returning Tigers to profitability in the form of profit sharing and stock ownership. Miraculously, at the end of 1987, Flying Tigers reported a record pre-tax profit of $106.6 million, a dramatic turnaround. The Tiger spirit had emerged once again. In 1988, a renewed Flying Tigers began focusing on a variety of marketing strategies that would carry it into the next century and establish it as a globally integrated system of air freight services. The theme of this strategy, we're taking care of business. In December of that year, a new chapter in history was recorded. About uh, an hour and a half ago, we announced in New York at the opening of trading on the New York Stock Exchange that Federal Express and Flying Tigers, a large air freight company uh, that most of you are familiar with, had announced an agreement that Federal Express would acquire Flying Tigers. From an idea born in the skies over China, Flying Tigers became the largest air freight airline in the world. With more than four decades of experience and less than 7,000 employees, Flying Tigers has provided service to virtually every place on Earth. We've always taken pride in having the capability of moving just about anything, anywhere. Our niche in the market has been our unique ability to successfully transport the unusual as well as the routine. We can all be very proud of our heritage and our company's place in history. The founder of Flying Tigers, Bob Prescott, passed away in March 1978. Prescott left us with something he nurtured and cultivated in his employees since the day he began the company. It was more than enthusiasm and resourcefulness. It was more than tenacity and perseverance. It was a spirit, the tiger can do spirit. Uh, he was, I guess, what would you call it, uh, a young man's uh, image of what I would have liked to have been. Um, idle, I guess is the word. Uh, he was a, a very rough, uh, craggy, um, homespun, uh, very down to earth. Um, uh, he was, uh, had a lot of fun, good sense of humor. And the one thing that you always depend on is the fact that he, he was probably the most frank and direct person that I've never met. I don't think there was a, a devious bone in his body.
He always gave you that impression, don't look back at any mistake because the guy is gonna catch up with you, but just look ahead. His aggressiveness in business and wanting to perfect and, and enlarge and the airline is, is my greatest re recollection of Bob. Now I think that can-do spirit started with Bob. I think that, that that was really his attitude. That, you know, don't tell me about, you know, the, all the reasons as to why you can't do it, but tell me, quote, how you think we could accomplish it and what tools you need to do the job with and those kind of things. And he was good about supporting that type of thing. He was not, not receptive to the reasons as to why you can't do things. And it never entered at my mind to ever say no. In fact, Jim Dern, who was the head of maintenance for many years, said to me one time, do you have no in your vocabulary? He said, every time I sit around a meeting, somebody asks you to do something, you always say, okay, we'll do it. And I often wonder, how do you know you're going to do it? And I said, never entered my mind that we can do it. Historically, I think any group of flying tigers that are given a challenge, and in many cases it's a challenge that seems uh, unattainable, the tougher the challenge, the more I've seen Flying Tiger employees rise to the occasion and just, uh, despite the obstacles, have just expressed the fact that they're going to do it, and they do accomplish it. Well, in my mind, the can-do spirit is almost a reaction. And when a decision needs to be made, they make it. Uh, when something needs to be happen, they make it happen. Whether it be in the terminals and the aircraft side of it or in the financial department, I've seen individuals um, Previously, when a financial analysis needs to be made in, in a half a day instead of a week, it, it just happens. It gets done. That can-do spirit is pretty astonishing. Uh, the more people were challenged or the more they were told you're not going to be able to accomplish something, the more resolution and dedication I think they came up with to uh, ensure that it uh, did in fact happen. Our people had this sense of urgency that's tied with the can-do spirit. So, so the employees that, that are part of our company what we end up doing is seeing people work very hard to accomplish something because we believe we can do it and we want to do it right. And it was everybody together. It wasn't just one person doing this or one person that. It was everybody together. You wanted to come to work. You kind of felt if you weren't at work, you were missing something. But it was fun. It was, I guess, the atmosphere. People care enough and have enough loyalty not only to the organization but to themselves to make things work that might otherwise seem impossible or impractical or illogical. Certainly the loss of tigers uh, is pretty emotional. You hate to think of the Circle T not flying the sky anymore. Uh, but like any legends, in order to achieve legendary status, you have to become uh, somewhat uh, historic. So uh, certainly to live on in spirit, if nothing else, than in, in the minds of the employees who have been part of this uh, program, part of this company. Uh, I think we all have a lot to look back on and a lot to feel proud of. Flying Tigers may be coming to an end, but the Tiger can-do spirit will live forever.